that's working. So this is called Playing with Fire, but it's a series on sexual addiction. And uh, we started out last week uh, talking uh, specifically about pornography, and uh, that was something that we talked about. But that's not uh, the only thing we're going to talk about in this series. But we talked about um, uh, Proverbs chapter 6. It says, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Now, the, the context here, or the other verses surrounding it, um, we're talking about, uh, talking about adultery, the sin of adultery. And, uh, for instance, um, the verse right before this says, For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. It says, Then can a man take fire in his bosom, his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? So is he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, Whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. And so the, the context here, even though these verses, I, they don't specifically say it, it seems that there's a reference in the Bible between, you might say, those that would involve themselves in sexual sins and those that you might say would try to play with fire. And for instance here, uh, it talks about walking upon hot coals. Uh, now sometimes people seem to somehow develop an ability to do this. I don't know how they do it. I'm not going to try to figure it out or attempt to do it. Uh, but that would be kind of a stunt, wouldn't it? Something that somebody thinks, oh, I can do this. I can walk on top of hot coals and not get burned. It's dangerous. It's foolish. Why would you do that? <laughs> Why would you do something that you know is dangerous? And, uh, you know, and here, the Bible's talking about sexual sins and how um, it's dangerous. You're just playing with fire. Now, in the New Testament, there's an interesting passage. It also seems to make a reference to fire. Uh, and it, it's talking about, uh, it actually was talking about a widow lady that you might say has been without a husband, and maybe she's deciding, do I want to get remarried? And the, the instructions Paul gives, it says, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. It is better to marry than to burn. Now, I know that's kind of a, just a short reference without getting into the whole, you know, whole passage and talking about it, but I think the idea is this, that Paul is saying that this passion that we have, this lust that sometimes people have, or these desires that people have are much like a fire, but there's a place for that fire, and that's, uh, you might say, marriage. That's the proper place for it. Now, um, you know, um, if we think about fire, and here's the illustration I gave, um, fire can do a lot of damage, and, and you can, uh, we had, you know, smoke coming into the area uh, the past month or so, and it was because of wildfires. They're doing a lot of damage up in Canada. They've done a lot of damage in different parts of the United States. And, um, and so, uh, obviously, fire has a lot of, does a lot of bad things. But if you keep fire in its proper place, just like I have here a picture of a campfire, you put rocks around a fire and you, you, put, uh, you build a fire inside that, it can keep you warm if you're cold. It's got a good purpose. And we have to realize that uh, in, in our society today, you might say the idea of our sexual passions, people want to say, let's let people, you might say, explore their sexual passions, let them, you might say, follow their de inward desires, and, you know, and what they're doing is they're allowing themselves, you might say, to just follow whatever they feel might make them happy. And what they're ending up doing, I believe, is hurting themselves. They're getting hurt. And so we have to understand, you might say, the proper place for these sexual emotions and how to contain them. Notice the, the passage here, this verse says, if they cannot contain, later on in this series, we're going to talk about, you might say, can we, you might say, control our passions? Well, I'll tell you this, just kind of thinking about this. Let me ask you this, which is easier to control a fire? If you contained it right from the beginning or if you started letting it get out of control and then you tried to stop it later? It'd be better to have, you might say, put, a, in a, put it in a container first, contain it first, not let it go, and, and then it starts spreading. You think, uh-oh, we better stop this. And, and I believe that what happens so much is people let their passions go, and they think, I can control it, and suddenly it gets out of hand. They think, oh boy, this is bigger than I can handle. And so let's think about that as we go through this series. Now, what we talked about last time, when it, uh, specifically when it came to, uh, you might say, and I'm calling it graphic images in this one, uh, but we talked about pornography. Um, one of the things in this, uh, some of the information that I got on this, 
Um, there's a, a book in our recovery series, uh, the Hid in Life series, uh, and uh, there are addiction recovery booklets. This one is on pornography. Uh, the one author is, is Steve Currington, the founder of the program. The other author he works with here is Dr. George Crabb, and he's a, a medical doctor who specifically uh, studies these different types of things. And in this book, he goes into a list of different uh, things that happen in your body. Obviously, there's different hormones, different things that are, you might say, affecting your body. For instance, uh, have you ever heard of an adrenaline rush? <laughs> Well, that's you know something that your body puts out when there's times of fear, or and uh, and there's been times people you know have ran fast and they thought they could run or lift something strong than they could physically thought they because they had this adrenaline rush. Somebody's you know had something drop on them and they have to lift it off. I'm like, how'd you do that? <laughs> I had an adrenaline rush. Uh, I had an aunt that uh, they told the story uh, uh, one time that she had uh, a mattress that caught on fire. She grabbed the mattress and just got an adrenaline rush and ran out the door with it so the whole house wouldn't catch on fire and ran down a flight of stairs with a burning mattress. And I'm thinking, man, you know, how do you do that? I don't know. It's just, you know, adrenaline kicks in and you just do things. Um, well, one of the things that our body produces is, um, is uh, something uh, called dopamine, all right? It kind of sounds like a drug almost, doesn't it? But that's something naturally that your body produces. But actually, a lot of what you use dopamine for is, is you might say, it, it gives you a confirmation that a behavior is good and that you enjoy it. For instance, one of the things he says is just something like laughing. Uh, you know, you think, oh, I enjoy, enjoy laughing. That's a good thing. And your body produces a little bit of this dopamine when you laugh, and, uh, and it, it's just kind of a confirmation to your body that this is a good behavior. Well, what happens when people begin to, to view graphic images and pornography and, and things, they, they get this rush of this uh, thing that your body is supposed to naturally produce, but they get, you might say, a big dose of it from your body by looking at these images, and, and what they do is it actually gives them such a rush that they're like, man, I really enjoy this. But what also Dr. Crabb and, and uh, Steve Currington talk about is after this rush of this dopamine from viewing an image, it also, you might say, you know, leaves your body with a, a low of, you might say, a depressed type feeling or a sad type feeling uh, because it's, you've done something unnatural with your body. And so your body can't just keep pushing that much dopamine continuously. And so then you have to, you might say, your body doesn't produce as much later and so you end up with a low point. So what happens is why do people sometimes become addicted to these graphic images, pornography, and so forth? Well, because they enjoyed that rush, and then they want to get, you might say, that rush again. And so when they're feeling sad because now they're in a low point, they think, well, uh, I need to go back and look at those images again. And so pornography becomes this cycle of addiction uh, that you might say is like a fire that people can't put out. And then what happens is people want to, they, they think, you know what, uh, maybe the first time they got quite this rush from looking at something, and then it's not as big of a rush. And so what happens is we said people begin to, you might say, do things that are more disturbing, and, and sometimes uh, begin not only looking at things, begin acting out, and that's something else we'll talk about later, is just different types of behaviors that follow. Now, does everybody start out, uh, you might say, with, with pornography as their source? Not necessarily, but this could lead to other, other sins and other ways of people trying to satisfy themselves because they want that, that rush, uh, that feeling uh, that they're getting. So we're, we're looking at this, though, and we were looking at this cycle of, of what happens and, and how that just, you know, they need the dopamine and they get it by viewing pornography, but it leaves them depressed, so then they keep going back and it starts a continuous cycle. Now, um, but so basically last week we were talking about how the sexual sins would affect your mind and emotions and, like I said, specifically pornography. But tonight I wanted to focus on this. How do, would sexual sins affect your relationship with God? And um, I left you off with this question or this passage last week, and I asked uh, you the question, do you love God. Now, so often, any sins we involve ourselves in, anything that we would do as a behavior, sometimes the, the thought is, this is only affecting me. It's not doing anything to anybody else. And a lot of times, people might not be able to look at something like pornography, and they think, you know what? 
maybe they're doing this privately in their, in their room on a computer and they think, you know what, this is only involving me, it's not affecting anybody else. And so I think it's important that we see how this is affecting uh, other relationships and specifically our relationship with God. And God tells us here in his word, uh, John the author here, uh, that was uh, one of Jesus' 12 closest disciples here, and um, he, he tells us, you know, the Holy Spirit guiding him what to say here, but he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So the Bible says, if you have this love for the world, then the love of the Father is not in you. You say, well, what does that mean? Because I think I love God. I think I can love God and maybe think I can also involve myself in, in something, uh, something else. Well, so he breaks it down here. What is he talking about when we love the world? Uh, it's not talking about loving people or, or loving, you might say, our planet or you know, cleaning up our planet, anything like that. What's he talking about? All right, he says, let me define it for you. For all that is in the world, and he says three things, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, uh, we could, we could uh, sometimes it's hard to put all these things in, into different categories. Uh, for instance, the lust of our flesh. For instance, our bodies have some natural needs, for instance, eating. And oftentimes when I think of our, our flesh, our desires, you know, uh, you, you need to eat, you need to sleep, you need to drink. There's different things that you need to do. And, and somebody might think, you know, well, maybe having sexual relationships is just a need of my body. But you might say this is, this is talking about, you know, I say going beyond the natural means or going beyond God's designated place for these and having just a, a, an uncontrolled desire. Uh, for instance, somebody could overindulge in food. Uh, and somebody, you might say, just has this lust, but it relates to our body. The lust of the eyes, uh, things that would catch our attention, something that would draw, you might say, our eyes and our focus away from God. Um, and, and so often things look good on the outside. Uh, and uh, for instance, in our household, my son's looking for a vehicle, and, and there's sometimes you look at a vehicle and someone's polished it up real nice on the outside, and you turn the key... And it doesn't sound real good. It doesn't, the engine's not running real good. Or you take it for a drive and you realize something's not right. And so often the lust of the eyes are things that entice us from the outside. They look real good, but they're not really godly. They're not good for us. They're not healthy things. And then the pride of life. Uh, we like attention sometimes. We like to be in the spotlight. We like, you might say, to, to get ahead. Or you might say, uh, want people to uh, think that we're somebody special. And, uh, and so often we let these things draw our attention away from God. And, away from, and the Bible says, if this is your focus, if this is what draws your attention, if this is the thing that you love, the things of this world, then what does the Bible say? The love of the Father is not in Him. Now, let's go on and, uh, and uh, think about this. Uh, in the Psalms, in the Old Testament, uh, David, uh, not me, but uh, Dave, King David, uh, he was a songwriter, and he wrote uh, many songs, and they, we call them the Psalms. And uh, in one of these Psalms, Psalm 17, uh, he, he and, and I won't read the whole Psalm, but he says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Now, here's one of the things that I want you to think about is that when we talk about sexual sins, we talk about, you might say, some sort of desire that we have. And sometimes we think, you know, I think I know what's going to satisfy this desire. I know what I need to satisfy my desire. Notice David here talks about finding satisfaction. And as you probably realize and understand, so often the things that people think are going to bring satisfaction in life are not really going to give them, make them satisfied. And so often uh, when it comes to sexual things... Uh, there might be, uh, you know, people that are looking to something to satisfy them, and they think, you know, what if I, you know, uh, uh, looked at this image or maybe got in a relationship with this person or something, they think then I'm going to be satisfied, then it's going to fulfill me, then I'm going to, you know, uh, no longer feel this this uh, lack of enjoyment, and they find that they're not satisfied. That images, the images they looked at on the internet, they're not, they're not fulfilling them. And they think, I need, 
I need more and more. And you know, what do people end up scrolling through the internet for hours looking for something to satisfy? And I'm even not just talking about pornography, but sometimes it's just Facebook or something else. People, you know, just looking for something to satisfy. And they're saying, man, if I just stayed on the internet, on YouTube and, and you know, Facebook and, and, and Instagram and uh, Pinterest or whatever, a little bit longer, <laughs> maybe I can find something that will entertain me and, and make me laugh and give me enjoyment. And, and it's just an endless scroll. I'm not satisfied. Well, <laughs> And, um, and then, you know, we're, we're looking sometimes even for a relationship. And, uh, and somebody might think, you know what? I think that if I met that perfect person, they would absolutely fulfill me. They would be my better half and they would satisfy me and make me completely whole. And they finally walk down the aisle and they get married and they think, oh, finally, you know, I'm complete. I'm whole. You know, I found my better half. But they they, they were looking to that person to complete them and fulfill them and satisfy them. Now, marriage is a wonderful thing, and we're going to talk about that. But we can never expect anybody to completely satisfy us and fulfill us apart from who? Apart from God. And here's the thing. If we're looking and searching for something to satisfy us and make us happy and make us whole and make us complete and fulfill our needs other than God, we're going to find ourselves disappointed. And so I want you to understand that it's so important that you have a relationship with God and make that the goal of your life. Now, like I said, it's important to have good relationships with other people, and and I I don't want you to think uh, that that's not important or that you can't find satisfaction in marriage. I don't want you to think that. But I want you to understand that if we're looking to somebody to satisfy a need that God's supposed to fill, then that person, we're we're expecting too much from that person by expecting them to do that. Now, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Romans? And uh, I think this is a good passage to look at because um, here in Romans chapter 1, um, and it's interesting, last week, if you remember, I talked about what was going on in the Roman Empire when Paul was writing, uh, I read from 1 Corinthians. Their emperor, Nero, uh, was actually uh, married to a, a, a boy who, what they say, he was castrated, this boy. Uh, and, and then caused this boy to be his wife. And then later, this same ruler, Nero, and sometimes you actually uh, see him pictured, and, and he seems to be dressed like this in, in, in artwork and so forth, but um, he actually later on is in a relationship where he's considered the wife. And so you have to understand that if this was taking place as the emperors of, of Rome at this time, and they say, I think that... Um, I think it was 13 of the 15, I didn't have that in my notes for tonight, but I think 13 of the first 15 uh, Roman empires at this time, emperors at this time, were were homosexuals. And a lot of things, even some things that we would find unacceptable in our society, were taking place in the Roman Empire, sexual sins and and, and so forth. And so when Paul is writing... um, Romans chapter 1, you have to be, uh, understand, you might think, Paul doesn't understand what's going on in our world today. He doesn't understand the enticements. And of course, he doesn't have technology like we have. He doesn't have a computer and the internet and TV and all these different things. But he was well aware of, you might say, the type of sexual sins that were taking place in his, the society today. And he, he identifies the real problem. And, and so often, you know, just like people come to a program like this, they think, I want to fix a certain behavior, but we got to get to the root of the problem, and it lies with our relationship with God. Now, look at this uh, passage beginning in verse 21. It says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like unto a corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and to creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, uh, there's a lot of applications we can make to this. Um, and I don't want you to think the application I'm making is the only application here, but I want you to understand that one of the things that I could apply this to would be the idea of images like pornography. Because the Bible says here that, um, that there was a time that people knew God, but they didn't want to uh, glorify Him. They didn't want to give the praise to God. They wanted the focus to be on themselves rather than on God. And they didn't want to thank Him. 
And they allowed their hearts to be darkened. And that's an interesting thought, that people rejected the light and wanted to be in darkness. And, and here's what they, one of the things it says, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, into creeping things. I, I, I thought it was interesting, the word image. Uh, do you notice that a lot of times in our society today, when we talk about things on your computer, uh, we talk about images, don't we? Now, in Bible times, you'd think, well, they didn't have uh, the same type of images. You're thinking of little statues made out of wood or stone or something like that, of an image. But, but here's what they often called them in the Bible. They called them false images. Do you ever hear that term? An idol, a false image. Um, I want you to think for just a minute. Uh, what is, you might say, a lot of the images and the uh, pornography on the, Im- on the Internet, it's actually fake, isn't it? They uh, make people look more beautiful, if you could call that beauty. Some of it's more disgusting, you might say. But anyhow, they try to take away the blemishes, the flaws, and try to make people, you might say, look better than humanity. Even the people that are in those pictures, they don't look like that. They've retouched them and made them and enhanced them in such a way. They're fake. They're false. Now, what I'm, what I'm saying is this, is that it's interesting here in the Bible times, we think about people you know, having images that were false images, and you think, you know, we don't do that today. What do we do, actually? People do that today. And in, in the Bible times, somebody would have these statues, and, and you think, well, that's idolatry. Now, what is it, you might say, that, that we're talking about? We're talking about something that is, resembles what God created. For instance, the Bible talks about you know, things like birds and, and four-footed beasts, but it also talks like images like unto corruptible man. That people would take an image of a person, but it says like that. In other words, just like um, if you know like Greek mythology, they took you know, and kind of had these images of different uh, creatures, you might say, that were half man and half something else. They, they like to kind of create false images by combining different things and making these images of of different things and then making them a god. Well, what do we do today? Well, on the internet, they take and make a false image, and then well, what, what do people do? They're looking to that to give them some sort of satisfaction. Well, in a sense, that's worship. That's giving your attention to something. It's, it's, you might say, if you think about someone staring at a computer, how is that any different than someone, you might say, in Bible times, looking at a, a, a graven image for worship? Now, whether you agree with my evaluation of this or not, I think I don't think that they're bowing down and worshiping those images, but they're looking to that for some sort of satisfa- sac- satisfaction. What did we say? Where are we supposed to find our satisfaction? In God. And if we're looking to something else to satisfy us, to make us happy, to fulfill us in life, and, and think it's going to give us some sort of satisfaction, uh, in a sense, we've replaced God with something else. And that's really what idolatry is. We've replaced God in our life with something else uh, that, similar to what God has made, but a fake version of that. And, and you think about, and, and, and I wanted to kind of deviate a little bit from this, but do you realize that a lot of what people like to do, and, I'm, and I don't want to criticize everything you do and think, boy, Pastor David's taking away all our fun tonight. But in a sense, a lot of what we like to do is create a false world of what God has. And in other words, um, you know, and uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's what a metaverse or whatever ever really took off. <laughs> but the idea of creating this false world, this fake world that people could go in and explore, and and maybe his thing failed, but I, I, I'm guessing that that's, that idea hasn't failed. That that's going to keep coming back up. People are going to try that again. People want to live in a fake world, in a sense. Because they think, oh, this world has so many problems, it has so many uh, you know, uh, things that just are painful and hard to deal with. I'd rather live in this false world. <laughs> We'd like to you know, take what God has made, but let's make a false version of it, a fake version of it, something that I enjoy. And, and so often there's different things that we can c- get caught up in. And, and sometimes you might say, you know, people are, are watching movies. And like I said, I'm not here to just criticize your movies. And, you know, but, you know... You think about, they, they present this, this false idea. Maybe it's a romance thing, you know, of this 
this guy that seems too perfect and this girl that lives in this perfect town and they, they, they get married and it all just seems a little bit too good to be true. And, I, and like I said, I'm not just like, you think, boy, I hope he doesn't start talking about my thing tonight. But, it, but what I'm saying is that's what has become part of our world, to find something fake, something false, and almost put ourselves into that position and allow ourselves to imagine our life, oh, if only my life were like that. Now, let me ask you this, and we're going to talk about this subject a little bit later. Um, do you think a man that stares at images that are fake and false and looks at women that are overly enhanced in a sense, do you think that he is going to find the average everyday female attractive anymore? Probably not. If he's so indulged in this fake imagery and, this, and he just, if he thinks this is what beauty is, looking at these fake images, he's going to have a lot of trouble finding a girl that he thinks is even good looking. So everybody I see is, you know, just doesn't match up with what I'm seeing on the internet. And, and what I'm saying is that, that what we're doing is sometimes, whether we in pornography or something else, we're creating this false sense of what we want. And, and, and most of all, it's affecting our relationship with God because we are not satisfied with what God made. If you look around and you think, you know, all these humans that God made, I don't like them. I like the fake people on the Internet. Wait a minute here. There's a problem, isn't there? And our problem isn't just with people. Our problem becomes with God because we've rejected God and rejected what He has made. Man was made in God's image. And can we improve on that? Wait a minute here. Is there something better than what God has made? I don't think so. And so you realize that here's, here's the idea that, that man would like to, you might say, create this, this false image of something similar to what God has made. And, and you, you realize here, and my point is this, it's affecting your relationship with God. And as I said, we're going to talk later about it, how it affects our relationship with other people. Um, in this same passage, just... It, um, I wanted to read this verse because it almost really confirms what we talked about last week. And uh, as we go on in this passage, let me actually read verse 26. I left off at verse 25. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burn in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and received in themselves that recompense of the error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And I bring your attention to this passage because there's a direct connection between our worship of God and our relationship with God, and the Bible says with a deviation from God's design for marriage and sexual sins, there's a direct connection. And again, so many people want to look at, you might say, the idea of looking at pornography or other sexual sins and think, this is only affecting me. Why does it matter? Well, it's clearly here from the Bible affecting your relationship with God. And here's, here's the thing that, that I, I, going back to last week, it says in verse 28, uh, yeah, verse 28, it says, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. It's affecting their mind. And that's what we talked about last week. It's affecting your thinking. And I, and I see, what I, I kind of see is this. We often use this phrase, our belief will affect our behavior. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Our belief will affect our behavior. But I also see this kind of going hand in hand, and I'll say it kind of backwards then. Then our behavior also is going to affect our belief. Because the Bible says they wanted to behave a certain way, and they knew God, but then, they, back in verse 21, their foolish heart was darkened. They allowed themselves to, because of what they want to do, they reject God, and so they start to believe differently about God because if I believe the right things about God, I can't behave like this because I know God will judge that, and God doesn't like that. So I don't want to believe the right things about God. I'll believe what I want to believe about God because it makes me feel better. It makes me feel comfortable doing what I want to do. And so here's what's happening. If you continue in a behavior that you know is wrong and you continue down a path of sexual deviation and pornography and different things like that, it is going to affect your relationship with God because God, as, as we said in John, you cannot say, I love God, and also say you love the world. If, you're, if, you, if you're either going to choose one or the other, and eventually 
you might think, well, I can go back and forth. I can love both. No, you can't. And eventually, if, if you continue down a path, and somebody uh, you know, just starts out innocently thinking, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a little bit of enjoyment, a little bit of pleasure, and pretty soon it's affected their relationship with God. Now, uh, I'll even give you an Old Testament example, King Solomon. Uh, and uh, in the Old Testament, King Solomon, the Bible says, but King Solomon loved many strange women. Strange doesn't mean that they all were, uh, you know, had big ears or big eyes or anything like that. Uh, it just means that uh, they were different. Like uh, they didn't, uh, the word strange here means they didn't belong to him. It wasn't somebody he should have married. Um, it wasn't his wife, uh, his first wife, you might say. But he loved a, a lot of women. All right. In fact, the Bible says um, in this passage that Solomon actually had, I, I always get it backwards, was it 300 wives, I think, and 700 concubines? It might have been the other way. Did you, am I right or wrong? I, but anyhow, it adds up when you add the two numbers up. Yeah, but it adds up to a thousand women in his life. Now, that's, that's three birthdays a day, every day of the year. I mean, that's just too much, all right? <laughs> One isn't what God designed. Two was too much. A thousand is, is 999 too many, right? Now, but what's interesting in this passage is the Bible goes on and says, and I just summarized it here, for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, little g, false gods. His wives, you know, and I don't know how they influenced him. They said, if you love me, why don't you worship my false god with me? You know, and, and Solomon thought, you know, I can still, you know, on, well, on, it was the Sabbath day, Saturday, we'll say, oh, I can show up on Sabbath day and Saturday and worship Jehovah God. But I can go on Monday and worship this false god, and Tuesday and worship this false god, and Wednesday here and Thursday there, and, and you know, and I'll go and I'll worship all these false gods. It couldn't happen, could it? And it turned away his heart from God. But it's because he, you might say, thought he could and, uh, follow after his love for women, his sexual desires, and it turned his heart away from God. Um, so... We'll end with this. I know I've, I've gone long here, and it's, it's, uh, you guys are uh, very patient with me. I appreciate it. But I want to tell you what I'm going to talk about next week, and uh, we'll end with this, and that's God's design for marriage. Uh, this is the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 19. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And God... Jesus here gives us, he said, let me share with you God's design from the very beginning. With Adam and Eve, one man, one woman, and this was God's design. And we're going to go into more details with it next week. But I want you to understand that there is a place of satisfaction, fulfillment that you can have. And it's not necessarily that we're just talking about sexual things, is it? We can find satisfaction and fulfillment through God. And I think the most important thing to realize is uh, not how I can please myself sexually, but how can I have a right relationship with God and realize that He is the one that can satisfy me and fulfill me. So let's bow in prayer tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You, Lord, for what You've taught us. And I thank You that You gave, gave us instructions on how we can find satisfaction and fulfillment. I pray that You help us to listen and obey uh, rather than choosing our own ways. In Jesus' name, amen.